Another day and another looming world crisis and it's got you thinking about Victory Gardens. Well, you're in luck because what we're going to talk about today is I'm going to give you a crash course on Victory Gardens. I'm going to be answering lots and lots of questions from what is a Victory Garden? Why do you want to have a Victory Garden? Challenges with Victory Gardens, what to grow in Victory Gardens, and on and on and on and on. This is really what you need to know about Victory Gardens before you get started. So let's get started. <laughs> So what exactly is a Victory Garden? Well, it literally was a program during World War II in multiple countries, including the United States. It was run by the United States Department of Agriculture and its main purpose was about increasing food security. And it did it a couple ways. First, it made sure that local citizens were growing a lot of their own food. And by doing that, then they would be able to ensure that the citizens at home are well fed. The second part is by the fact that citizens were growing a lot of their own food, that meant the big farms that could still produce food could bring down their costs, which meant that when the government, the Department of Defense was buying food for our soldiers abroad, they could do it at a lower cost, which meant that they had more money then to do supplies such as ammunitions and other war vehicles. So, so it was about increasing food security for our citizens, increasing food security by lowering the cost of food for our soldiers. And it was during World War II, so it was a global crisis. So is what we are doing today actually then Victory Gardens? Well, yes and no. A lot of people when they're thinking about doing Victory Gardens are trying to increase their personal food security. They're trying to decrease their personal costs and it's usually coming at a time of crisis, like world type crises. So, in that way, yes, but is it still a United States Department of Agriculture program that's actively happening right now? No. So does that mean that a vegetable garden is a victory garden? I think the answer is yes and no. And here's why. A victory garden is really focused on ensuring that we create food security. It is really focused on decreasing costs. And everybody's vegetable gardens aren't necessarily doing it. There's a lot of people who do it for fun because it's pretty and they get some food out of it, but it isn't about the efficiency that's really driven by a victory garden. So when we're thinking about victory gardens, yes, there's a sense of patriotism. Yes, it is vegetables. Yes, there's probably fruit in it too, but there's a lot of focus on the efficiency of increasing food security, reducing costs, and there being a world crisis. So you're sitting here thinking, well, you got me. I want to start a victory garden. I want to increase my food security. I want to decrease my costs. And of course, I got another world crisis on my hands. So how much food do I need to grow? Well, just for some numbers, the average family of four eats a literal ton of fruits and vegetables every year. I'll say that again. A family of four eats about 2,000 pounds. Actually, it's about 2,200 pounds of fruit and vegetables in a year. That's a lot. So being able to grow your entire diet out of your yard will depend on how much land you have and the mix of food that you try to grow. So what is it that you're supposed to grow then in a victory garden? Well, it really comes down to three different types of things. Food for calories, food for nutrition, and food for hydration. Yes, hydration. So when you're in a time of crisis and the supply chain is starting to break down, you need, of course, calories. This is the fuel for your body. Think things like potatoes and sweet potatoes, high starchy, lots of calories. Nutrition, well, these are your vitamins. So think about the entire rainbow. You want the reds of tomatoes and the oranges of carrots. You want the blue and purples of berries. All these different colors are gonna naturally give you vitamins in case you can't get vitamins that are coming out of a store. And while you may have calories and you may end up having nutrition, a big thing that people don't think about when it comes to growing food is hydration. Yes, everyone knows that they need water, but what a lot of people don't recognize is that you can get the majority of your water out of things that you eat. And so growing plants that give you a lot of hydration can help fulfill the need if water becomes scarce. So think things like watermelon, oranges, you know, those things that you bite into and then the juices go everywhere. Think things like cucumbers and lettuce. They are high water content plants that actually hydrate you without you drinking a drop of water. And now you're probably thinking like, okay, I get it, but like, what do I grow? And this is kind of a hard question to answer because it depends on where you live. What works well for me may not work well for you. I live in zone 10A, which is subtropical to tropical. I mean, I've got bananas growing in my front yard and you may live in, I don't know where, <laughs> but if you're not living in a similar zone, similar climate, I do really well with helping people who live in zone eight, zone nine, and zone 10, but specifically have subtropical climates. Zone eight can mean a lot of different things. That's North Florida to Washington state. So find YouTubers who have similar and like climates to find out exactly what to grow and when to grow it. Other resources that you can use are things like universities, 
Um, a lot of the ones that focus on agriculture have really good guides on what to grow and when to grow it because they're not only trying to help people, but they're also trying to help small farmers too. And another resource that works, I think a lot more for the temperate climates, not really as well for us in the subtropics is the farmer's almanac. But for my people who live in the subtropics and would really like some help, go to www.wildfloridian.net slash calendar for this free seasonal gardening calendar. It is a digital copy that you can, as soon as you sign up for it, download it and print it as many times as you want. It will give you information on what to grow each season along with tips to help work through the subtropical climate that is Florida. Before we get started with talking about what you need to start a victory garden, let's make sure that we understand a few of the challenges that you may run into and may not expect. One is climate is a huge factor in understanding. It is really important. I can't stress it enough. You really do need to understand where you live. It can be so different. And I think that can be one of the hard parts is you can watch a YouTuber up in Washington state or in New Jersey or over in Kentucky, and it's just gonna be very different. It's so important that you find people who live in very similar climates and you're following along for what they're doing when they're doing it. Yes, if they were growing something for winter and now we were heading into spring, make sure you're staying up to date with what it is that's growing and when it's growing. If you're looking at this right as it comes out, we're just leaving winter and heading to spring, but you can see I have a lot of vegetables growing but this would not work in Maine, right? So make sure you understand your climate and what to grow and when to grow it. But before we start talking about where to put your victory garden, we need to talk about, well, the thing that might stop you from putting a victory garden is, and that is the law. This is kind of one of the weird things. Yes, victory garden started out as a USDA government program, but now governments aren't necessarily protecting your right to grow food. And before you think I'm going super extreme, here's the thing, 1950s happened, there was a huge housing boom and we put in a lot of grass. And with that grass started to become, well, people liking the look of it. And we started to put in regulations and laws in place at the local level to ensure we kept the look, which meant we spent a lot more time focusing on how pretty a lawn is and not on how practical a lawn is. But for most locations, there aren't necessarily gonna be laws that protect your right. What you're really looking for is laws and regulations that prevent. That oftentimes they come in places like structures, like can you have raised beds, things like arch trellises, and they may actually only wanna regulate how close or far you are from something. The other thing is, is that if it's gonna to have to do with aesthetic peel, they're often only focused on front yards. They won't really pay as much attention to side and backyards. The other place that you wanna look is nuisance laws. This will have to do with things that may be animals and livestock that you might wanna keep composting and how you deal with that. So those are some of the things to look into. And one of the ways to easily find this is go and check out local gardening groups on Facebook. A lot of those people have already gone through things and know what you can and can't do for your area. Now, all this stuff that I just said may completely go out the window if you live in an HOA. So make sure that you check your CCNR or talk to your local board to see that you can grow food, whether it's as a vegetable garden or fruit trees or whatever the case may be, so that you can have a victory garden. Now, here's the good thing is that since the pandemic started in 2020, I have heard from a lot of people who live in HOA communities that there is a lot more interest and a lot more um, flexibility that they're creating within the CCNRs in many communities. So just because your CCNR doesn't say today that you can grow a vegetable garden, victory garden, or a permaculture garden in your yard, it doesn't mean that they're not open to it. So make sure you reach out to your local board. When it comes to starting a victory garden, one of the first things you need to do after you've done all this background information is to start building a plan. And one of the things that you should think about as you make your list of plants for your calories, your nutrition and hydration is what are their needs? And all plants have three basic types of needs. They need food, they need water and they need sun. And when it comes to food, the basic is, is that you just need really good soil. Most vegetables and crops can grow in pretty similar neutral to semi-acidic soil. That's where you're gonna get your lettuces, your cabbages, even into things like bananas, carrots, all of that generally has some pretty similar soil needs. So getting things like bulk soil to go and amend, depending on how good or bad your soil is, making sure that you have access to water, whether it is having an irrigation system, being able to pull a hose over and water it, or, you know, just hand watering it. You can do that too. 
but can take into consideration how much time you have because especially when you establish it they need to be watered pretty regularly and the last thing that you need to be considering is how much sun and this is going to be a thing that has to do again with your climate what zone you're in and again this is where i tell you guys to watch out when it comes to zones because like i said washington state's in zone eight and also is north florida but the sun is very different in those two locations stay in an hour in washington and stay in an hour in florida and your skin will tell you the difference in the sun so here in florida we tend to need only four to six hours of direct sunlight for our vegetable crops and fruiting plants versus if you live up north you will tend especially the far northern parts of the united states you're going to need probably closer to eight to ten because the sun rays just aren't as strong so you understand what you want to grow you understand the needs of those plants but you have to look at how much space do you have and it can be as small as a pot in this pot right here i actually have three different crops growing <laughs> really yes i do so you can see there are some carrots. This is that big leafy thing right here. I've got some garlic. And then in the middle, I've got a small tomato plant. All three of these are growing together with nice, happy soil. And they're gonna be producing me three different crops. So work with what you got. And starting small in the beginning is actually a really good way to start. And while you may be able to only start in a pot, if you have a little bit more land, and I'm not talking acres, I mean, look at this. This is a standard flower bed. And we've got raised beds, plus a whole entire butterfly garden in the front. So you don't need a ton of space to grow a lot of food. But raised garden beds don't work for all types of plants. <laughs> they are really good for those low growing plants such as peppers and cabbages and lettuces and garlics and onions. But you may want to consider doing something that goes up to really maximize your space, especially with things like tomatoes and squashes and beans and cucumbers so that they can grow up, up, up. When it comes to starting a victory garden bed, a lot of people are just thinking about one snapshot in time and that's just getting it started. But really in order to increase your food security over time, what you're going to really want to do is think about what you're going to grow in every season. And putting together a plan actually is really critical. So if you're going to do something like a raised garden bed, don't just think about what you're going to plant today. What are you going to plant the next season and the season after that? This is where becoming a more skilled gardener actually becomes really important so that you are maximizing the space throughout the entire year so that you're getting crop after crop after crop. This is how you're going to end up getting 500 pounds per person. And one of the really good ways to get yourself very organized organized when laying things out like what's going to be in my bed for winter, spring, summer, and then make sure that you actually stay on top of that is using something like a gardening planner. And you can get this one at www.wildfloridian.net slash planner. I'll put the link in the description below. It's a digital copy that you can download, of course, again, immediately. And this is how I keep myself on track with making sure I'm getting seeds planted at the right time of year, that I'm thinking through each season as it's coming. So yes, I'm doing some cold weather crops right now, but what am I gonna be doing for the spring? Which I'm actually gonna cover in one of the upcoming videos. Is this getting overwhelming? Let's take a deep breath. Let me give you kind of the cheat way of dealing with all this information. Go to the store. Go to one of your big box stores like a Home Depot, a Lowe's. Go to one of your local nurseries and see what they have on the shelves. What they have a lot of on the shelf. Not the little bits that are left, but what that's a lot of the product there. Because that's going to tell you what's supposed to be growing right now. Because they know the gardeners who know what to do are looking for those plants. So what you can do is you just go to the shelf and see, ah, Tomatoes seem to be in season. There's a lot of them. And here's the fun thing. They put these nifty little cards on them that tell you a lot about the plant. So instead of you being an expert, just follow the instructions, grab the plants. Now you may be thinking, but isn't that not the most cost effective? I've heard from others, you wanna start with seed. It, the most cost effective thing is what gives you the best return on investment. If you don't know how to start seeds yet, start with starts. Yes, it's more expensive, but it's still cheaper than buying all those tomatoes at the store. I mean, you're going to spend maybe $4 on a plant like this. I actually noticed that Home Depot and Lowe's have actually started a new thing where they're starting with like kind of the easy plants. And those are a $2 a little pot, $2. And if you get even two pounds, your plants paid for itself and you're already saving money and you will learn a lot along the way. So don't get overwhelmed. Start with starts. The information's right there for you. And here's the thing. I've been doing this for years and years. I got behind schedule and I'm grabbing starts too. So don't feel bad about it. Now let's talk a little bit about how you increase your yields even more. A lot of focus is often put on Victory Gardens on vegetable gardening, but this is the thing. Remember, it's all about getting the most amount of food out and things like, well, 
perennial plants actually can give you much more yield in the long run. They may not get you food as fast, like in a 30, 60, 90 day, but within six to nine months, plants like bananas, papayas, sweet potatoes can give you a lot of food and will be helpful for you for year after year after year. Now, this may not be the plant that will work for you if you don't live in Florida, but actually is something you should be considering is, what grows quickly and gives lots of pounds. And while bananas may not work for your area, there are plants that are doing the same idea for your home state. So consider what doesn't take up a lot of space, but actually gives a lot of pounds, a lot of calories and a lot of nutrition for you and your family. Another thing a lot of people don't think about when they're thinking victory gardens, because we're in the time of crisis, is that how you maximize your yields doesn't just depend on the plants that you plant and the way you plant it, but also what you plant near your plants. And that has to do with butterfly gardens, pollinator gardens. These are the things that are, can be the difference that make a difference with you out even recognizing it. Having a place for butterflies, which can increase your yields by pollinating your tomato plants and your pepper plants, having spaces for them is really important. Also having plants like goldenrod, which hosts wasps. Don't freak out, but wasps are actually really good. I'm not talking big yellow jackets. There's these little tiny wasps and they actually host on plants like goldenrod, but they will come to feed their little babies, all those aphids and scaly mealy bugs that are gonna try to destroy your vegetable crops. So consider how are you gonna add things around your victory garden that will bring in wildlife that's gonna actually help you get more food in the long run. And another thing that you're gonna wanna do, cause wow, we've just increased your yield so much. You have hundreds of pounds of food, but what are you gonna do with all of that? You can't eat a hundred pounds in a weekend. And if you've never gardened before, well, you may find out maybe the hard way is that you can actually in a weekend end up harvesting 20, 30, 50, a hundred pounds of food very suddenly and now you're overwhelmed with it. So learning techniques to be able to preserve, which can be super basic, putting it in your fridge, freezing things, and learning things like how to can salt and be able to pickle things is a really important skill to be able to maximize how much your food lasts throughout the year. And while I've given you a total crash course on Victory Gardens, if you would like to go much deeper into this topic, check out my nine part series on Victory Gardens. If you wanna learn more about vegetable gardening down here in Florida, go ahead and check out this playlist. If you wanna learn more about butterfly gardening, because I'm a big proponent for getting wildflowers and butterflies into your garden, go ahead and check out this series. Remember all the links in the description down below for videos and things that I talked about down there. All right, I'll see you soon. Bye.